Hi guys, I wanted to welcome you back. Today we have a new project we're working on. It's called uh, basically counting. We're going to be counting pulses, counting events, counting stuff that happens. <clears throat> or we might have a situation where we simply need to be alert to signals that are sent that mean something interesting has happened that we need to now go do something about that. So I want to first present you guys with a sort of naive program that uh, a beginner might come up with in order to solve this problem. And then I'm going to point out what's sort of naive about it. it. It may be obvious from the beginning. But then how do we deal with it? How do we write programs that can interpret signals and be ready to do something when certain events occur? Okay, so that's the idea. So the, the notebook for this week is called Counting Experiments, and, and the experiment described in here, or the program described in here, is, is uh, very simple. I'll demonstrate it in class. I'm not going to talk about it right now. It's about counting uh, radioactive decay events. If you have a Geiger tube or a Geiger counter that counts pulses that come in, um, you want to be able to, when a pulse happens, you want to catch it, and you don't want to have to rely on software to check at just the right time to make that happen. I'm going to illustrate why that's a problem right now. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, so uh, here I've got, let's see if it's the right thing, yep, um, Polling Count <clears throat> is a program that uh, is sort of a naive, actually let's take a different view of this, let's look at it this way. Um, it's a kind of a naive uh, program Let's see what it does. Uh, in On the oscilloscope there on the screen, you can see I've got a signal coming in at right about two cycles a second. You'll notice that the uh, it's a square wave. The time base is set to 100 milliseconds per division, and it takes about 500 milliseconds to go through a full cycle. And in the next 500 milliseconds, you can't quite see that, I guess, all the way. It looks like it goes through another full cycle there. That makes Maybe that makes it a little better. I don't know. Um, and then it starts over again. So uh, you can see it's within 1% of exactly two cycles per second. So if we were going to watch this signal, and we were watching it very carefully, we could count the number of rising edges. That means when the voltage goes from 0 to 5 volts, or actually it's it looks like it's more like 3 volts here. When it goes from 0 to 3 volts, we want to catch that and count it. We should get about 2 counts every second. And so this program is meant to find those places when that occurs and to count them. So we look at, we're using input pin 2. I'm going to have a few variables here to keep track of what's going on. So count is a variable that I'm using to keep track of the actual number of uh, rising edge pulses that we see. I also want to print every second. I want to print out how many pulses we've seen. And so in order to do that, if I'm going to uh, do that in this uh, loop function, I need to have a global variable in the module, the C program, that keeps track of the last time I printed. So I can check to see if a thousand um, or if a million microseconds have happened since the last time I printed, then I need to print again. Um, you could do it also with milliseconds. So uh, it doesn't really matter. Then the other thing I want to do is uh, every time I print, I want to have a print counter that prints out what the current count is. Um, now I could do this in an infinite loop. I could make an infinite loop inside the loop function. But the reality is a lot of times on the uh, Arduino platform, you want loop to execute over and over again. And so you don't want to make, put an infinite loop inside the loop function. You want the loop function to be called periodically. So that's kind of the idea. Um, let's see what happens here. I set up the serial port. I declare the input pin to be an input. And I keep track of the last time I printed. I'm, I've not printed at all yet, but I want to record the number of microseconds since the thing was booted so I can use that to see if it's time to print. So the first thing I'm going to do is read in the input pin. I'm going to check to see if it's 0. If it's 0, then I'm going to read it again and check to see if it's 1. If it's 1 now, that means between this digital read and this digital read, the signal transition from 0 to 1. That's a rising edge. I want to count that. So I'll go in here and call the update count function. Update count simply increments that counter, and then I'm done. Uh, the other thing I want to do is check 
Has it been more than a million microseconds since the last time I printed? If it has, I'm going to record how many microseconds it is right now. I'm going to increment the print count, and then I'm going to just print the print count and the number that I've counted. So let's go ahead and look at that. Um, the print count is going, but wait a minute. I'm not getting any... Oh, there's one. Wait a minute. The frequency here should be... You can see it's... Uh, it's printing, but it's only printing... Um, a few counts. I mean, it's been 24 seconds, 25 seconds, 26 seconds. I should be getting two counts every second. I'm, I've only got eight counts. Most seconds go by, and I don't count anything. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> interesting. So what happened there? Uh, somehow, when I went to the serial monitor and flipped back to the code, it, it the video merging software didn't flip back to the code. But my point is, um, if you if you look at this situation right here, um, this it's easy to miss this. If you happen to measure val too early and then you measure val again, it's not going to be 1, it'll be 0. And then the next time you measure val, it could be a 1. So you miss the transition. And then you, this logic won't actually work. And there's there's lots of ways. you could, The transition could happen while you're printing. Printing takes a long time. And... Uh, all this stuff can happen and, and you'll miss it. So the point is, it's not really very reliable to use software to check for voltages changing level. Um, if, if you don't care about the time, you could have a static variable that measured the last measurement that if it, and, but you wouldn't catch the actual transition, you'd be late then, right? Be, because a lot of stuff could happen between when the transition actually occurs and when you measure it. So we need to find a better way. And that better way is basically called an interrupt. Okay, so here's what I want to do. That Obviously, that didn't work. Let me run that again just to validate. Um, there was some weirdness happening with my uh, camera not capturing the output and the code at the same time. There it is running. It's counting, but you'll see it's missing. It's missing most of them. It's only got three counts after six seconds. It should have at least double that. Uh, actually, it should have 12 counts after six seconds. So um, clearly it's not working. And it's not working because this is just not a reliable way to count. So what I want to do is to introduce the idea of an interrupt. So I'm going to add a function here. And uh, it's called attach interrupt. And the way attach interrupt works is you tell it the pin you want to interrupt on and there's a translation that has to happen so there's a function called digital pin to interrupt which converts a pin number to an interrupt number for the attach interrupt function so just call this guy get the interrupt number pass that into attach interrupt you, you give it a function that you want to call whenever the interrupt occurs and then you say do you want to do you want to interrupt on a rising edge a falling edge any change at all um, Anytime it's high, anytime it's low. So you can, there are different styles or different types of interrupts. Let's see if I just, uh, see if I pop into Safari here and just Google Arduino attach interrupt. There's a documentation here. And it describes on the official Arduino boards which pins are interruptible. The Artemis Nano, they're all interruptible, so you can pick any pin you like. And then it describes the attach interrupt function. And uh, then it shows you the modes. So low, changing, rising, falling, or high. Um, we'll mostly use rising and falling just because most of the time you don't want to count every time it goes up or down, although there are times when you do. Um, in that case, you could do change. Um, very rarely would I use low or high, just because uh, it will generate so many interrupts that uh, you know I don't know that that would really be necessary. So, anyway, uh, we're going to pick rising here. So anytime the pin rises, it's going to it's going to call this interrupt function. The interrupt function I'm going to have it call is update count. So notice that. This way, whenever the pin changes, update count gets called directly by hardware. I don't actually have to call it anymore. So the first thing I can do is take this business of reading the digital pin and calling update count. 
I can just get rid of that it, because it's going to happen in hardware now. The other thing is, if I don't have to keep track of when I've printed last, I can get rid of the last print. I can get rid of the print. I can get rid of that last print. And uh, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't have to worry about how long it's been since I've printed. I can simply increment the print count and print. And then I can just delay for a thousand milliseconds. Right? I don't need all that logic to check to see when I printed last or any of that stuff because I'm not trying to... St the reason I needed that before is because I didn't want to miss a transition. But now I don't care if I miss a transition. So I could just delay here. It won't matter. I'm not responsible for updating the count anyway. But I could also do a lot of other interesting stuff here. I could talk to the serial port. I could see if there are commands to execute. I could send data back to the serial port. I can do anything I need to. The business of keeping track of the count and making sure that the count gets incremented every time this signal happens, I'm no longer responsible for. It's like I have two computers running now. I've got the interrupt computer that's handling the interrupts, and I've got the computer that I'm programming that's doing the other stuff, the, the linear stuff. So it's, uh, it's the beginning of multitasking, really. It's not really two computers. It's the same computer doing both. It's just that you don't have to worry about managing the calling of the update count function. It happens through a hardware interrupt. So let's let's compile this. I hopefully I didn't make any mistakes here. It compiled. Let's run it. And let's see if it's more reliable now. Well look at that. Every single time it goes up by two. Okay. So what's interesting is now let's see how if we can push that a little bit. Let's increment the frequency. So I'm going to turn off the signal. I'm going to um, update, change the frequency. Let's go ahead and make it uh, 10 hertz. 10 cycles a second now instead of 2. And run it. Now it's going uh, 5 times faster. Let's check and see if that works. Well, by golly. It works. I can. It's counting reliably. Ten every single. Never misses one, right? Isn't that incredible? Uh, well, it looks like it missed one there, but that's actually because you'll notice that my frequency isn't exactly ten. It's actually nine point nine. So it's uh, every hundred, it's going to miss one. Actually, every ten seconds, it's going to get ninety nine pulses. So after twenty seconds, it's going to have. Uh, 189, yep. Okay. So, uh, okay. Let's stop it. Let's take it up to uh, 100 hertz. Why not? Life short. Let's restart it. So it's easier to see. I'm getting 100 pulses a second now, and look at that. Again, uh, oh, I'm, I've got to reduce my time base on the oscilloscope. It can't keep up. Uh, let's do this. Okay, I'm at 5 milliseconds per division. And it looks like I'm, uh, I'm not exactly at uh, 100 hertz, but I'm, I'm close enough. Hey, guys, I just realized I forgot one important thing I should have remembered when I added the attach interrupt that we need to make this uh, volatile. We need to make the count variable volatile and that's because um, because of the way memory gets managed in in C and because of the fact that um, interrupt routines can happen uh, in the middle of math and memory being loaded and uh, manipulated and printed and so on you could you could be in the middle of this print routine and uh, because count could be modified when you update count if it's a long variable it has multiple bytes and parts of one byte could be updated and the other byte hasn't been updated yet and if you don't have any way to tell the calling routine that this is a 
um, a special variable, it might not realize that other people can update it while you're uh, dealing with it. So what basically what it means is this is a hint to the compiler that it, you need to treat this variable specially. And so it's important that you call these things volatile. Um, you can read about volatile if you Google it. But basically, anytime you're doing interrupts and you're sharing memory, you're sharing variables between interrupt routines and the main program, um, it's important to to uh, to do that. The other thing you can do if you run into trouble is you can disable interrupts during critical sections of code where you need to make sure that the interrupt doesn't mess you up. Um, so FYI, that's uh, so volatile. Anytime you have a variable that gets used in an interrupt routine and it's shared with other code, be sure to declare it as volatile.